Thank you, Your Honor. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Linda Donikoski. I, along with Larissa Olivier and Paul Camarillo, represent the people of the state of Georgia and the citizens of Glen County. Today, you are Glen County. So why we are here is to go ahead and present you with the state's closing argument. Now, the state gets to go first and last because the state has the burden of proof to prove this to you beyond a reasonable doubt. But not just to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt the charges in the indictment, but remember from voir dire, you were asked, can you give meaningful consideration to the defenses presented by the defense if they put any up? Okay, and, and what we've heard is what? Self-defense and citizen's arrest, which the state has to disprove beyond a reasonable doubt to you as well. So ladies and gentlemen, what the state's gonna do right now is we're gonna go through kind of I'm going to give you a snapshot, that kind of like, here it is in a nutshell sort of thing. And then I'm going to take you kind of through systematically, piece by piece, what the law is as it regards the charges in the indictment, self-defense, and citizen's arrest. All right? But the one thing I want to tell you before we got started is this. You will have a copy of the indictment with you in the back. Okay? So you don't have to write down the charges in the indictment. You have a copy in the back. In addition, Judge Walmsley is going to give you a copy of the law, okay? So you'll have a copy. So when I'm putting the law up here, you don't have to furiously write it down. You will have a copy of it back there with you, all right? So let's go ahead and get started. This, this case is really about assumptions and driveway decisions. Now, you heard the defense talk about, well, probable cause. You're gonna have to distinguish between assumptions based on gossip and rumor, and all this neighborhood talk on Facebook, an actual probable cause to believe a crime had been committed and someone had committed that crime. The state's position is all three of these defendants made assumptions, made assumptions about what was going on that day, and they made their decision to attack Ahmaud Arbery in their driveways because he was a black man running down the street. So here's what we've got, the bottom line. They assumed he must have committed some crime that day, because he's running real fast down the street, right? They did not call 911. They wanted to stop him and question him before they called 911. How do we know? Because that's what they told the police that night. That's what they said on the scene. Hey, stop, we want to talk to you. Yeah. <clears throat> Can't do that. They made these decisions in their driveways. So what's really going on here? You know what's really going on here? Mr. Aubrey was under attack. They committed four felonies against him. And those are the four felonies in the indictment. Then they shot and killed him, not because he was a threat to them, but because he wouldn't stop and talk to them. And they were gonna make him, absolutely make him stop. We're gonna point a shotgun at you. That'll make you stop. That should make you stop right here in your tracks because we want to talk to you. And what did he do? He still ran away. Still ran away. For five minutes, ran away. Travis McMichael went to intercept him with that shotgun and he turned that corner. We can't see whether Mr. Arbery attacked him or grabbed the shotgun or anything. It doesn't matter because how fast did he shoot him? How fast did he just pull that trigger? They shot and killed Maude Arbery. They all acted as a party to the crime. You'll note they've been indicted that way. And I'm going to talk about what party to a crime is so that you understand that concept. But the bottom line is, but for their actions, but for their decisions, but for their choices, Maude Arbery would be alive. And that's why they've been indicted with murder, felony murder, and the four felonies that led to the murder. So what is the defense? I mean, we're, I'm just gonna take it right down there. We talked about that, what is the defense? We got self-defense, what is that? Well, they're gonna try and convince you that Ahmaud Arbery was the attacker, that um, he was somehow threatening to them. Three on one, two pickup trucks, two guns. 
Mr. Aubrey, nothing in his pockets. Not a cell phone, not a gun, not even an ID. They want you to believe that he is the danger to them. And Mr. Rubin said it in the opening statement. He was scary. So here's the thing. They're going to try to claim that they were justified in their actions. OK? Because here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot claim self-defense under certain circumstances. You can't. You don't get to say, I was acting in self-defense. And there's three of them. And it's the law. This isn't just something made up. There's three of them in the law, OK? If you are the initial unjustified aggressor, you don't get to claim self-defense. If you're committing a felony against somebody, you don't get to claim self-defense. And the third one is if you provoke somebody so that they defend themselves against you. And then you go, oh, look, he attacked me first. But you really were the one who was provoking the attack on yourself. You don't get to claim self-defense. And that's the law. So here's the problem. They're going to try and claim they were justified in starting this in their driveways. They're going to try and claim they were justified in committing all these felonies against Mr. Arbery. How? Because they're going to try and convince you that this was a citizen's arrest. That's what they're going to do. But here is what a citizen's arrest really is. Okay? This is what the law says. This is the statute. And the judge is going to give it to you. A private person may arrest an offender if the offense is committed in his presence, right here, right now, I'm seeing you do it, OK? Right here, right now, I'm watching you commit the crime. I'm witnessing it. You're doing it in my presence. So what's the problem for the defendants? Well, we all know that Mr. Bryan's on his porch fixing it. Where's Travis McMichael? He's on the sofa inside the house. Where's Greg McMichael? This all started when I saw him running down the street. Now, it also says, or within his immediate knowledge. Well, the judge is going to charge you that that's synonymous. It means the same thing. So you've got to think about, well, in my immediate knowledge, what does that mean? Think about the eye in the sky, you know, at Walmart. Like, you're in Walmart, right? And you see all those things in the ceiling. You know there's a guy in a booth watching a bunch of video cameras, right? So he's not standing next to the person shoplifting, right, when, he, when she shoplifts, right? What's he doing? He's watching it on the camera. That's immediate knowledge. He's not right there next to the person shoplifting, but he's watching it. So he has immediate knowledge because he can see it eye in the sky. That's just an example, how to think of immediate knowledge. But immediate knowledge and in your presence is the exact same thing. In order to make an arrest and if, of an offender, the offense has to be committed in the private citizen's presence. Do we have that here? No. In addition, you will be charged, this is the second line, if the offense is a felony. So once again, the offense has to be a felony. The judge is going to charge you. Criminal trespass and loitering and prowling <coughs> are misdemeanors. OK? I'm going to pause right now. I'm going to ask you to read the criminal trespass thing. In order to be a tr criminal trespasser, you have to enter on the property with the intent to you know, do an unlawful act. Or somebody has to have told you you can't come back here, like Larry English or his representative. Well, Mr. Arbery was never told, don't come back here. You're not allowed. This is private property. He was never told, so he doesn't fall under criminal trespass. Now, I don't want you guys to make the mistake of thinking that we're endorsing, kind of, or not acknowledging what Mr. Arbery was doing. I mean, let's get real. All right, what was Mr. Arbery doing? <coughs> He's going on to somebody else's private property. Yeah. What was he doing? We can see it. Wandering around for a few minutes each time. Right? And then what would he do? He'd leave. On video, never took anything, never damaged anything. So ladies and gentlemen, you decide. Is he this giant burglar who just happened to never show up with a bag or any means to steal anything? All right? Or is he a looky-loo? Yeah, a looky-loo who's going in there at night. He shouldn't be doing that. I mean, we all know this, OK? But it's trespass. It's a misdemeanor. 
And on February 23, 2020, none of the defendants knew that he had been inside, in broad daylight, that location. And what did he do on the 23rd of February? Did the same thing he always did. Wandered around, wandered around, and then left and ran off down the street. But they didn't know that. They had no immediate knowledge of that. It wasn't in their presence. Travis McMichael's on the couch. Mr. Bryan's in front of his house. Greg McMichael, you saw, he can't even see down the road. There's that trailer there. Remember the drone video? Citizen's arrest. This was not a citizen's arrest. Not present when any crime was committed. The suggestion that Ahmad committed a crime is based on what? Not immediate knowledge, speculation. Speculation. How do we know? Because of the defendant's own words to the police. That's how we know. Wanting to question Ahmad demonstrates uncertainty. Hey, where are you coming from? They don't know where he's coming from. What are you doing? They don't know what he's doing. Remember Mr. Bryan? Heard, what'd you steal? Okay? They don't know what he's done. They don't know why he's out there running. They don't have immediate knowledge. They have no knowledge. They have speculation because he's running down the street. Wanting to question Ahmad demonstrates a lack of immediate knowledge which is required, required under the citizen's arrest law. Because it's required, that means this was not a lawful citizen's arrest. Remember what Greg McMichael said? Did this guy break into this house today? I don't know. But hey, law enforcement officers, I'm sure he must have committed some crime today, so why don't you go out and figure out what crime it was that he must have committed today? Why do they think he must have committed something? Because he's running down the street. He might have gone into somebody's house. Pure speculation. And after he's lying there dead, Greg McMichael's there telling the police, hey, why didn't you investigate? I'm sure he committed some crime today. That's not a citizen's arrest. Not legitimate at all. So what are you going to hear? I, I hate to interrupt closing argument, but the state is misstating the citizen's arrest law repeatedly in this section of its argument. And I'd like the court to instruct the jury that the law will come from the court. This is not an accurate statement of it. <clears throat> the court is going to charge the jury on the law. And uh, as indicated, you'll have a copy of that charge with you to review during your deliberations. Thank you. Judge is going to charge you these exact words. Judge is going to charge you these exact words. So what are you going to hear? The state suspects that what you're going to hear from the defense is this, that Travis McMichael had probable cause to believe that Ahmad stole the stuff off the English's boat in 2019 and was escaping that felony on February 23rd, 2020. Not really sure how you escape on February 23rd, 2020 from a crime you supposedly committed on some unknown date in 2019 that Travis McMichael's mom told him about. But basically, we have this where he came in, took the stand, and said, yeah, that's what was going on. So I was going to go ahead and arrest him for this. Here's the problem. This was completely made up for trial because no one anywhere at any time ever mentioned Larry English's boat. Never on February 23rd, 2020. Travis McMichael had two hours and 45 minutes to talk to the police. He was given an hour to write a three-page statement, an hour to write it down. Never, ever, ever once said anything about this. So what can you go ahead and assume? a year and nine months later. Completely made up for trial. All right, so simply put, ladies and gentlemen, if you determine that this was not a citizen's arrest, this was not legitimate, he had no probable cause, you can't do this based on the law, then guess what? They're not justified in killing him. They're not justified in any of the felonies they committed against him. 
not a citizen's arrest. Therefore, you're not justified. You're the initial aggressor. You're committing felonies. Eh, Self-defense. And that gets us to the charges in the indictment. So that's what we're looking at here. Based on that, at that point, you may find them guilty of all the charges in the indictment. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was the snapshot view of what I think you're probably going to hear from the defense and what the state's position is on that. So now we're going to do some deep diving. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about the juror's duty. We're going to talk about some legal concepts that you need to be aware of that the judge is going to charge you. We're going to go over the charges in the indictment. We're going to talk about party to the crime. And then we're going to kind of really get into what self-defense and citizen's arrest is. And I know it's going to take a minute. Bear with me, but this burden's on the state. So we have to go through all of these things. All right? So here we go. Juror's duty. First off, this is your search for the truth, okay? This isn't about the state. This is your search for the truth. You are Glenn County. You decide whether they're guilty or not guilty. Not the defense attorneys, not the state, you. Your search for the truth. You determine what really happened based on the evidence presented, okay? And ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you right now, what's the evidence presented? Well, you can go ahead and look at State's Exhibit 190, which was the actual video. 191 is the half-speed video. You can take a look at State's Exhibit 194, the night owl video. You can go ahead and take a look at 129. That's that close-up compressed, um, sort of enhanced for coloration video that was produced that shows the close-up of Travis pulling that shotgun up. You can go ahead and take a look at State's Exhibit 117, Officer uh, Rash's video. You can also take a look at 124, the video from December 17th, 2019. And of course, you can always ask to see State's Exhibit 315, the frame by frame if you want to see it. So how that works is you send a note to Judge Walmsley and you go, we'd like to go ahead and review that evidence and you come into the courtroom. When you come to the courtroom, we don't, have, we don't get to say anything, okay? Nobody gets to talk. And actually, at that point in time, you're in control of what you get to watch here in the courtroom. So I want you to be aware of that in case you want to review any of this evidence. All right. You are the finder of fact. Not the state. Not the defense. You are the finder of fact. You determine witness credibility. All right? You're the one who decides whether you believe these witnesses or don't believe these witnesses, or how much weight you give a witness's testimony. You're going to apply the law that the judge gives you to those facts as you find them to be, and that's what you're going to do. So you have a duty to follow the law. You're bound by the instructions and the law that the judge gave you. In other words, this isn't about becoming an advocate for one side or the other. This is about what are the facts, and here's the law, and we apply the law to the facts. You have a duty to deliberate. OK. The reason I put this slide up is because one time we had a woman who went and hid in the bathroom for like an hour and a half. Like, hid in the bathroom. And the jurors didn't know what to do. They were just sitting back there for an hour and a half and had no idea what to do. Anything like that happens, just send the judge a note, OK? Anything weird happens, anything you're unsure of happens, send the judge a note. But you have this duty to deliberate, to talk about the case. Now, sometimes it's helpful to think about what's inside the circle and what's outside the circle, OK? Because there's some things outside the circle that you're not or shouldn't really talk about. <coughs> And what are those? Well, that mostly concerns penalty and punishment. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to be given a verdict form, and on that form, you're going to write not guilty or guilty. That's all you're going to do, OK? So it's not about passion or prejudice or you disagree with the law, you don't like the law, conjecture. It's about the evidence. And so what do you consider? Well, you consider the elements of the crimes. Judge Wamps is going to give you that. The law. The expert testimony, okay? fingerprints, fibers, the medical examiner, the photos and documents. Look at the crime scene photos. Take a look at those photos. They're hard, but take a look at them. The testimony of the witnesses, the credibility of the witnesses, the defendant's actions, their driveway decisions, and how it led to someone lying dead from two gunshot wounds in the middle of the street the elements of the offenses, the reasonableness, 
and above all, use your common sense. This is the time when you put on that critical, that critical thinking cap, okay? Meaning you question everything. It's sometimes really easy to see somebody and you want just to go, well, I want to believe what they had to say. You know, I, I don't want to believe automatically that they're a liar or anything like that. I, I, I want to kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. This is the time, ladies and gentlemen, that you put on that critical thinking cap where you go ahead and scrutinize everything the people on the stand said to you. So, reasonable doubt. That's the doubt of a fair-minded and impartial juror honestly seeking the truth. It's not about seeking out doubt. It's about seeking the truth. And it's not beyond all doubt or to a mathematical certainty. No, no, no. It's just beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the burden that the state has. All right, so the evidence. The first thing you're going to want to do is determine what really happened based on the evidence. But a lot of the evidence isn't in dispute, right? I mean, we know what days Larry English called the police. We know when we have videos. We know this was on February 23rd. The homicide's on video for the most part. Okay, a lot of these things are not necessarily in dispute. What's in dispute is, were they making a citizen's arrest so that they were justified in committing these felonies against Ahmaud Arbery and then murdering him? I mean, that's really what they're arguing about here. So remember, it's not a whodunit. Glen County police arrived very quickly. Afterwards, <coughs> Minshew heard the shots. The defendants all made statements at the scene, immediately after. They're making statements. They're saying stuff to the police. Then, a couple hours later, the defendants are all down at the Glen County Police Department, also making statements. But here's the thing. You've got to ask yourself, were these self-serving statements? I mean, think about it. The very first thing that we showed you was Duggan's body cam video. It was hard, right? But you've got to realize, Travis McMichael seen him right behind Duggan when he rolled Mr. Arbery over. That's what he saw. That's what Greg McMichael and Mr. Bryan saw. So then you've got to think to yourself, OK, what's going on in their heads? There's a dead man in the street. Travis McMichael has just shot him, OK? The police are on the scene. There's now a video of it. So are there statements a couple hours later self-serving? You decide. The GBI did their investigation starting on May 5, 2020, followed by the arrests. So first off, the credibility of witnesses. That's for you to determine who you believe and who you don't believe. Okay, so what does that mean is you're the one who decides whether Travis McMichael was telling you the truth or lying to you. All right? So let's talk about some of the defense witnesses. Annabelle Beasley, what did she do when she got off the stand? She walked over here and waved at them as she walked off the stand. I mean, I know you all saw that, right? Okay, so Annabelle Beasley, Team McMichael. Subi Lawrence, who is she? Boy, Team McMichael. Even after this, I mean, I, after the shooting, she and Brooke Perez and Diego Perez, they're going out in the boat with Greg and Lee McMichael. They're still hanging out with them. Okay, Team McMichael. Brooke Perez, Team McMichael. Up until February 11th. And then what did she tell you? Her husband, Diego Perez, had had it with this. Had had it with Larry English, not calling the police. Had had it with helping out Larry English. He wasn't going to do it anymore because this was not cool. Why was it not cool? Because Diego Perez went inside that house with his flashlight. And Greg McMichael came up and went in the house. What was Brooke doing? My husband's in there. My husband's in there. All right, well, Greg McMichael had his gun. Travis McMichael told you that. He had his gun, Diego had his gun, Brooke had her gun. You know, everybody had a gun. Everybody in this case had a gun, except Maude Arbery. And so, what almost happened? I mean, come on, let's get real. It's a miracle Diego Perez and Greg McMichael didn't kill each other inside that house, right? Pulling guns out. And that was it. What did Brooke tell you? No more, not doing this anymore. You determine the credibility of those witnesses. Now, when you consider Travis McMichael and his testimony, here's some things you want to look at. The judge is going to tell you, these are things you consider. The manner of testifying. Evidence of bias for or against a party. Does he have bias for or against Greg McMichael? It's his dad, OK? Motive in testifying. Yeah. He wants you to come back with a not guilty verdict. It's in his best interest. Think about the probability or improbability of their testimony. I wondered why he was attacking that truck. But 
on Holmes? Like, what are you talking about? I have no idea. I mean, do you guys understand what he was getting at? I mean, I guess we're back to Ahmaud Arbery's a carjacker. Their interest or a lack of interest in the outcome of the case, meaning do they have something to gain or lose by coming in here and making up a story for you? Their personal credibility as you observe it. That's for you to decide. Not for the state to decide, not for the defense to decide, for you to decide. All right, so did Travis and Michael have a motive to lie to you? Do you have a motive to make up additional things that he had never said before? All right, did he have a motive to embellish his testimony? Did he have a motive to claim he now was confused on February 23rd, 2020? Isn't that convenient? Wow, it was the most traumatic. Yeah, and I don't dispute that it was probably the most traumatic experience of his life. How did Mr. Arbery's day go for him? All right? Most traumatic experience for Travis St. Michael. So he's all confused, but did manage to write out a three-page you know, statement and immediately put down, on January 1st, my gun was stolen had all sorts of contextual details in that statement. Did he have a motive to use talking points? Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, did he come up here? How many times did he say totality of the circumstances to you? Did he have his talking points down a year and nine months later? That's for you to decide. The defendant's story. The law allows you to disregard his testimony from the witness stand if you don't find it credible. The law allows you to consider as the actual real evidence his actions at the time of the murder if you don't find him credible. Intent to commit a crime. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you got to find that they intended to commit these crimes, and when you, how do you look at that? Well, you look at the, the natural and necessary consequences of the act, right? Natural and necessary consequences of an act. Deadly force is the last resort. Never point a gun at someone you do not intend to shoot. So when you start pointing a shotgun directly at somebody, what's your intention? The natural and necessary consequence of the act, you're going to kill this person. You're pointing it at. The defendant's not going to be presumed to have acted with criminal intent, but you may find intention or the absence of, of intention upon consideration of their words, their conduct. What did they do out there? Their demeanor, their motive, and other circumstances. So when you look at each defendant separately, because that's what you're going to do, you're going to get three separate verdict forms. When you look at Mr. Ryan, what were his words? What was his conduct? What's his motive? What were the circumstances there for Mr. Ryan? What were they for Greg McMichael? What were they for Travis McMichael? All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the charges in the indictment. All right? I'm going to make a suggestion to you. This may help you. Start at the bottom of the indictment. All right? In your deliberations, start with criminal attempt and false imprisonment. It's just easier. You just work through that one. Work your way on up, then to felony murder, then to malice murder. Just, it's a suggestion. So what have we got? Criminal attempt to commit a felony, which is false imprisonment. What's an attempt? That's when you perform an act which constitutes a substantial step toward the commission of said crime. Mr. Bryan pulled out of his driveway and ran him into a ditch. Mr. Arbery was able to keep running. Right there, criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment. Criminal attempt to commit, a fall, commit false imprisonment. This is actually what it says in the indictment. What do you have? In violation of the personal liberty of Mr. Arbery. Okay? Guess what? We're citizens of the United States, right? We live here. We have personal liberty because this is a free country. Other people can't go up and stop us and hold us and detain us. Okay? They have to actually have seen us commit that crime in order to effectuate a citizen's arrest. So you go around and you start stopping people, you're doing that in violation of their personal liberty. And what did they do? They unlawfully chased Ahmaud Arbery through the public streets of Satilla Shores in pickup trucks and did attempt to detain and confine him without legal authority on Burford using an F-150 pickup truck and a Chevy Silverado pickup truck. We all know that's what they did. 
False imprisonment. Now, this is over on Holmes. In violation of the personal liberty of Maude Arbery, to unlawfully confine and detain Maude Arbery without legal authority. Once again, did not see him commit any crime, not a citizen's arrest. They are not law enforcement officers. They are not in a marked patrol car. They are not with badges on their arms. They're not in any uniform without legal authority. Said accused did chase him out Arbery with an F-150 pickup truck and a Chevy Silverado pickup truck to the public roadways of the Satilla Shores neighborhood and did confine and detain him on homes. Travis McMichael said he was pinned between the two trucks. Greg McMichael said he was trapped like a rat between the two trucks. The ultimate false imprisonment, he never left Holmes, did he? Never left Holmes. Aggravated assault, did make an assault upon the person of Ahmaud Arbery with a Ford 150 pickup truck and a Chevy Silverado pickup truck. I got a legal note here for you. Okay, you notice how it says and. Okay, but what do we know? Mr. Bryan's driving the Silverado. Travis is driving the Ford F-150. Greg McMichael is in the passenger seat at first, then he's in the back of the truck. So of course, it doesn't mean and, it's or. Okay, I know that sounds crazy. Don't you love lawyers? Don't you just love lawyers? Okay, and means or. So the way you should read this is with a Ford F-150 pickup truck or a Chevy Silverado pickup truck. Okay. So, what are pickup trucks? They are objects when used offensively against someone can result in serious bodily injury or death. You hit somebody with the F-150 pickup truck intentionally? You hit them with the Silverado intentionally? Are you going to hurt them? Break a leg? Paralyze them? You can even kill them. We all know that. Hit and runs, right? Vehicle homicides. We all know this. And the medical examiner told you so. Actual injury to a mod need not be shown for aggravated assault with the pickup trucks. The judge is going to instruct you. You don't have to actually hit the person. You don't actually have to injure them for it to be aggravated assault. What you have to do is place that person in reasonable fear of receiving a violent injury. This is really important, ladies and gentlemen. Did the defendants commit acts with their pickup trucks that placed Ahmaud Arbery in reasonable fear of receiving serious bodily injury? Yeah. Yes, they did. We know Mr. Bryan did. He ran him into a ditch, then tried to go at him again, then went at him another time, then backed up toward him. Now, what did Travis McMichael get on the stand and said, oh, I just pulled up next to him. No, I didn't startle him. No, he wasn't afraid of me. Do you believe any of that stuff? Just look at the Night Owl video. Look at how Mr. Arby tries to get away from them, and then look at them speed off after him. So all you have to do is look at that Night Owl video, and you'll know that they put him in reasonable fear of receiving bodily harm, violent injury, aggravated assault with the pickup trucks. Aggravated assault in count six. Did make an assault upon the person of Ahmad Arbery with a firearm, a deadly weapon? That 12 gauge pump shotgun with seven already in it. <clears throat> Two steps, pull the trigger. That's all you gotta do. The evidence is that the defendants attempted to cause a violent injury to the alleged victim by shooting him. Yeah, that's aggravated assault with a shotgun. Now I want to be really clear, okay? Travis McMichael does this with the shotgun. We see it on the video. This is the beginning of the aggravated assault. Beginning of the aggravated assault. The aggravated assault continues as he steps away from his car door and blocks the road. Now, what did he say to you? Oh, he's putting distance between me and Mr. Arbery. Was he putting distance or was he blocking the road? You decide. Then what does he do? He doesn't stay right there, does he? We can't see this, but what do we know? He makes it around that car door right? He makes it over here, right? He's in front of his truck, and he's moving forward, closing the distance on Mr. Arbery, intercepting Mr. Arbery, and is right here with that shotgun. It wasn't at court arms like this. It was right like this. And how fast does Mr. Arbery come around the corner? And boom, shoots him. That is one continuous aggravated assault ending in the shotgun blast to his torso, right here. Came out right here. Right? So how was he when the shotgun hit him? 
like this, right? Got it across the wrist, got it right in the torso, came out right here. So he's turned like this, according to the medical examiner. Felony murder. Felony murder is when you commit a felony and someone dies because of the felony. Classic felony murder scenario. Guy goes into a convenience store to rob the convenience store. He's not there to murder anybody. He's not there to kill the clerk. He doesn't know the clerk. But he's got a gun, right? So what does he do? Pulls out the gun and is pointing it at the clerk. And the clerk's like, uh, 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 and what does the clerk do? The clerk goes and tries to hit the gun away and starts punching at the armed robber, right? And then what does the armed robber do? Boom! Kills the clerk. Was committing a felony. You cannot claim self-defense. You've now murdered the clerk because during the felony that you were doing, you pointed a, uh, you were doing armed robbery. You're pointing a gun at somebody. You expect when you're committing felonies, people are going to fight back, right? The convenience store clerk's entitled to fight back, right? Imagine if armed robbers could come in and go, well, I had to defend myself against the victim of my crime. Could you imagine if that was the law, right? I mean, but isn't that what they're saying? How dare Mr. Arbery defend himself against their four felonies? Isn't that what they're saying to you? So felony murder, let's take a look at it. What is felony murder? For felony murder, the state must prove that the defendant caused the death of another, check, by committing a felony. Check, we got four of them. Do not need to show malice, okay? Meaning intent to commit the death of somebody. You know, it's like the guy showed up at the convenience store, he's not there to murder the clerk. Do not need to show he intended the death with the felony. <coughs> what we have to show is this, that the felony directly caused the death you pulled the trigger on the shotgun, aggravated assault the shotgun, yeah, immediately caused the death, right? That's a no-brainer. But what about the other three? You're sitting there thinking, okay, Linda, what about the other three? What are we really talking about here? Did the other three felonies, aggravated assault with the pickup trucks, false imprisonment, criminal attempted false imprisonment, did they play a substantial and necessary part in causing the death? The state's position is, yes, they did. In other words, but for this felony being committed, the death would not have occurred. It's real easy. But for the felony being committed, this death would not have occurred. All right, so when does this really apply? The defendants are in the process of committing a series of felonies. They're doing it together at the same time. The defendants shoot Mr. Arbery during the commission of the felonies. Did that felony committed against Mr. Arbery ultimately contribute and lead to his death? So how do we look at this? Aggravated assault with a shotgun? Yes. Pointing that shotgun at him, having him run away around the side of the car, Travis McMichael intercepting him with the shotgun and then shooting him? Definitely. Aggravated assault. Felony murder. Aggravated assault with pickup trucks. Well, once again, what do we have? Would he be dead if he hadn't been pinned between these two pickup trucks? Think about this. If he made it up Holmes, and over on Zellwood, he'd have run out, right? If he hadn't been pinned between the two pickup trucks on Holmes, with Mr. Bryan running him towards the white pickup truck, would he still be alive? Yeah. Their use of the pickup trucks to go ahead and commit aggravated assaults on him, put him in fear of them and their pickup trucks meant he was running away from them. He saw it, running away. Did their actions, were they such that they put him in reasonable fear of receiving bodily injury? And did that contribute to him ending up where he ended up and his death? Yes, it did. Felony murder. False imprisonment on Holmes. That's what we're talking about. Did they falsely imprison him on Holmes? We've already gone over it. Had him pinned on Holmes, trapped like a rat between the two pickup trucks, according to Greg McMichael, He's still, after five minutes, running away from them. If they hadn't done this, if they hadn't done this on Holmes, would he be alive? Ask yourself that. If the answer is yes, felony murder. Check it off. Criminal attempt at false imprisonment. So you're thinking, well, Linda, I mean, seriously, okay, that was a Ron Burford. I mean, yeah, they pulled up to him. Hey, stop, we want to talk to you. 
He runs away. They pull forward. They go down to the end of Burford. He then runs away from them again. They're trying to falsely imprison him over there. Did that contribute to it? Yes, because that's when they began their attack. They're using the pickup trucks over on Burford to put him in reasonable apprehension of receiving serious bodily harm. They're putting him in fear with their actions. What does Mr. Bryan do? Tries to, not, that doesn't try, actually runs him into a ditch. Runs him into the ditch. Aggravated assault. So what's Mr. Arbery doing? We know he runs away from them and runs away from them and runs away from them. Because they have tried to falsely imprison him on Burford and they've used these pickup trucks to do it in a manner that's likely to cause him fear. But we don't know what was going through his head. Nobody knows. That would be speculation. But you're allowed to look at it and go, were their actions such that it would put a reasonable person in fear of getting hurt? That's what you want to ask yourself. Those are the felonies in the indictment. So malice murder. What's malice murder? Well, cause the death of another person unlawfully and with malice of forethought. Now, malice of forethought is not ill will or hatred. It's not like what we think of. No premeditation is required, okay? Rather, it's the unlawful intention to kill without justification, okay? Well, what's justification? Justification is self-defense. Deliberate intention to kill is one way you see malice murder. I'm deliberately taking your life. I'm killing you. How do we usually think about that? Huh? You're out to get somebody. You want the uh, husband murdered for the insurance money. Uh, you, you're you're going to go ahead and execute somebody. You're mad at somebody. You're enraged at somebody. You intend to kill them. That's deliberate intention, right? But there's another kind of malice, and that's implied malice. You are allowed to consider this when looking at malice. You may also find malice when there does not appear to be significant provocation and the circumstance of the killing shows an abandoned and malignant heart. Don't you love lawyers? What the heck is an abandoned and malignant heart, right? Well, think about that. You just don't care. You just don't care. What you're doing, you want to do what you want to do. And boy, whoever you're doing it to had better be OK with it. I'm going to order you to stop and talk to me. And if you don't, I'm going to pull out a shotgun on you. And hey, you're still going to run away from me? Oh, yeah, I'm going to come at you. I'm going to intercept you over here at the corner. How dare you turn on me? Bam. Malice, right there. Remember, Mr. Arbery had to have engaged in significant provocation. What did he do? What did Mr. Arbery do? He ran away for five minutes. He ran away from them. He ran away from them for five minutes. That's what he did. With his hands out at his sides, in those baggy shorts he had on. No weapon, no threats, no way to call for help, didn't even have a cell phone on him. Ran away from him for five minutes. The state doesn't have to prove premeditation. The state does not have to prove motive, OK? Not required to explain to you why they did what they did. You know what they did. Some of you may know why they did it. But the state does not have to prove exactly why they did what they did. The indictment. So here's the thing, party to a crime. How in the world? Could Defendant Bryan be held responsible if he was in the Silver Auto filming all this, right? How can Greg McMichael be held responsible if he's in the back of the truck, finally on the phone with 911 when the shots ring out? Well, it's called party to a crime. That's what it's called. So what's party to a crime? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you this. Do you think that everyone involved from the person who actually commits the crime to someone who encourages or enlists someone to commit the crime, to someone who helps commit the crime, should be held responsible under the law in Georgia. Do you think that that, that, that sounds reasonable? Well, guess what? The law does. 
The law says everybody involved is guilty. Okay? The person is a party to a crime only if that person directly commits the offense. Driving the trucks, pulling out that shotgun, attempting to falsely imprison, helping to trap somebody by pinning them between two pickup trucks, running someone towards a man with a shotgun, all directly committing or helping in the commission of the crime, or advises and encourages. Well, what's advising and encouraging? Hey, Travis, get your shotgun. That guy is outside. Not, hey, Travis, I need to call 911. That guy is outside. Let's get our guns and let's jump in the truck. Encouraging. Advising. Cut him off, cut him off, cut him off. Is what Greg McBichael said. So that's what we've got. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you really want to think about this? Everybody gets a Super Bowl ring, right? The quarterback gets a Super Bowl ring. The guys in the field get the Super Bowl ring. The dude on the bench gets a Super Bowl ring, right? Everybody is involved. Everybody's responsible. That's what the law says. Cooperation after the fact. Now this replies to the defendants, but mostly you know, kind of Mr. Bryan, because this has been brought up when he was talking to Agent Seacrest and everything. So first off, cooperation after the fact doesn't erase the crime you committed. Brian did film the murder on his phone. He gave the phone over in the video right away to the police. He made statements to the police at the scene at Glen County. He then goes and makes additional statements to the GBI in May of 2020. He consented to have his home night owl video downloaded. Guess what? Doesn't matter. Cooperation after the fact does not erase what you have done. Okay? That would be like two teenagers shoplifting at Walmart, and one's filming the other, hee hee hee. Both of them are stuffing bikinis into their bag, right? The fact that one of them hands over her video of her girlfriend doing it, does that somehow make her not guilty of stuffing a bikini in her own bag? No, you still did the crime. So what if you were cooperative afterwards? Still are responsible for your actions. This is about responsibility. All right, we're gonna transition right now. I'm going to take a breath, and we're going to transition into self-defense and citizen's arrest. A person is justified in threatening or using force against another person when and to the extent that he reasonably believes that such threat or force is necessary <coughs> to defend himself or a third person against the other's imminent use of lawful, of unlawful force. Wow, that's a mouthful, right? Yikes, okay, let's break it down. Travis McMichael had to reasonably believe that it was absolutely necessary to defend himself, and of course he threw in his dad, okay, which he never mentioned before at any point in time, but he threw him in on the stand, against the other's imminent use of unlawful force. That means Mr. Arbery had to be right there, imminently using unlawful force against Travis McMichael. Okay? It's the doctrine of reasonable beliefs, and the judge is going to go ahead and charge you on this. In other words, the belief that you have got to defend yourself, that it's life or death right here, right now, has to be reasonable. Okay? Guess who this standard applies to? Just take one guess who this standard applies to. Everybody. It applies to you. It applies to law enforcement. It applies to military people. Okay? It applies to Jason Bourne, Secret Service, CIA, FBI. It applies to everybody. There is no special exception for I was in the Coast Guard. There is no special exception for I used to be a law enforcement officer. The reasonableness applies to retired law enforcement officers, just like it applies to anybody. A manager of a store, okay, applies the same way. In other words, the reasonableness standard is set by society. You all decide whether this was reasonable or not. 
Travis McMichael's belief that he had to defend himself with lethal force has to be reasonable. So we got pointing a shotgun at Mr. Arbery when he's yards and yards away, had to be reasonable and necessary. But where's the imminent use of unlawful force by Mr. Arbery? What was he doing? He's running away from Mr. Bryan's truck. Mr. Bryan has already tried to hit him with the truck numerous times. He's trapped between two cars with no weapon, no way for anyone to help him, because there's nobody out there to help him. He's not threatening anybody. He's just running away from the man with the shotgun. Look at this. I mean, take a look at this. He's not even up to those mailboxes on the side. And that's Travis McMichael pulling that shotgun up. Well, what are they going to tell you? They're going to they're tell you what Travis said. Oh, he was running toward me. And I could tell he was going to attack me. Is that reasonable? Who brought the shotgun to the party? Who took the shotgun out of the car? Who pointed the shotgun? The guy's running. Running away from them for five minutes. Here's the thing, you cannot create the danger to yourself. That means you cannot be the initial unjustified aggressor. You can't create the situation and then go, I was defending myself. You just can't do it. He moved to intercept. He attacked him. I'm not talking about Mr. Arbery attacking Travis. All right, here's the concept of excessive force. And this is a big one, because here's the thing. If you use excessive force during your self-defense, guess what? You're not justified, you're guilty. Not justified, you're guilty if you use excessive force. Because it's force that exceeded what was reasonably necessary. You guys ever heard the term that's saying, uh, you can't bring a gun to a knife fight? It's unfair, right? You can't bring a gun to a fist fight. It's unfair, right? You can't use excessive force. You can't call someone out and go, hey, buddy, let's take it outside. You're starting it. And then when that person starts to beat you up and is better at the fight than you, you don't get to pull out a gun and shoot them. You started it. You called them out. They're better at this than you. And all of a sudden, you're like, I'm scared. I have to defend myself. That's not the way this works. Excessive force. So first off, Ahmad had to be using unlawful force against them. Remember the guy running down the street right here? He's using excessive force. He's using unlawful force against them right here, right? Then Travis McMichael had to reasonably believe that he had to defend himself against Mr. Arbery. And they're going to get up here. And the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, they're good. These defense attorneys are good. They're going to get up here, and they're going to make it perfectly. They're going to make this seem like, oh yeah, this is scary. And Travis had to pull a shotgun out on him. They're going to make it seem so reasonable. Put on your critical thinking caps. Use your common sense when they're up here giving their closing arguments. The amount of force has to be reasonable. Unarmed man running with hands at the sides. Never pulled out a weapon. Never threatened anybody. This is completely excessive force. Even if you think Ladies and gentlemen, even if you go, hey, it was citizen's arrest, hey, he was really defending himself, you then still have to go, this wasn't excessive force, in order to find them not guilty. All right? What you didn't hear from the defense in their opening statement are the three instances when a person can't claim self-defense under the law in Georgia. Can't be the initial unjustified aggressor. This is important. You can't store it with your driveway decision unjustified because you didn't see a crime committed that day and then claim, oh, I acted in self-defense. What's their justification? What are you going to hear? We wanted Ahmaud Arbery to stop and talk to us, and he wouldn't. So we tried to force him to stop, and then we killed him. I mean, that's really what they're going to get up here and tell you. They'll probably make it seem much more palatable and OK, but that's really what they're going to tell you. You can't commit felonies against someone and then claim self-defense. You can't be the armed robber in the convenience store pointing the gun, and when the clerk goes to defend himself by grabbing that gun or hitting the armed robber, you can't shoot him. 
The law goes, not self-defense when you're committing felonies against someone. And you can't provoke someone into defending themselves against you so that you can intentionally harm them and then claim self-defense. Okay, what's that about, ladies and gentlemen? Think of your schoolyard bullies. Think of the three boys walking behind the one who's the target you know, kid who's getting abused, right? Okay, so you got three on one, they're going down the hallway, they're menacing him, maybe threatening him, and they get him up against a locker, and he has nowhere to go. He's trapped, right? So what does the kid who's being bullied do? He takes it, and he takes it, and takes it, until he can't anymore, and he finally shoves the one bully, and what does that bully do? <coughs> Bam! Punches the target child, right? What's the bully always say? He started it. Isn't that what the bully always says? He pushed me. I was defending myself. Yeah, three on one with one kid up against a locker. You're bullying him. And he actually pushes you, and you get to then claim you were acting in self-defense when you punch him? Guess what? The law knows people do this. I mean, you get this. This is the law. The law knows people will go to other people into defending themselves so that they can claim, I was acting in self-defense. You can't do that either. Three on one, two pickup trucks, two guns. Unarmed. Mr. Arbery was unarmed. So what are you going to hear? I don't know what, to, I don't know what they're going to say. They're good. They're good defense attorneys. They're going to get up here, and I'm, the state is so worried that they're going to make it seem so reasonable that everything that Travis did and Greg did is just so reasonable. I'm just going to ask you, use your common sense and put your thinking caps on. But this is what I anticipate, what we anticipate they're going to say. The victim started it. Or you're going to hear that he was the aggressor, okay, because he was running towards Travis McMichael, but he was running away from Mr. Bryan, who'd already tried to hit him with the pickup truck. And Greg McMichael said it. He was trapped like a rat. He knew there was nowhere else to go. You know? Or they're going to tell you that, ladies and gentlemen, this is really about the front of the pickup truck. Forget everything else. It was all about the front of the pickup truck. And they're going to try and make it seem like, well, he attacked Travis McMichael. He very well might have. We can't see. What we know is his hand was like this, right? Doesn't matter. You know why it doesn't matter? Because they weren't committing a citizen's arrest. They weren't in fear, real fear, of imminent danger from Mr. Arbery. They were committing the four felonies. That's what they were doing. You're going to hear, we weren't committing felonies. We were doing a citizen's arrest. We weren't trying to provoke him into defending himself. You're probably going to hear this. Yes, we pointed a shotgun at him to get him to comply with our orders. Not sure why anyone should comply with their orders. To stop and talk to us, but there was no reason for him to defend himself against us. Because this was a citizen's arrest. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the bottom line. As I said in opening, I'm going to say it to you again. This was an attack on the law library. They committed the crimes. They committed the four felonies. They attacked him. They shot and killed him. They can't claim self-defense under the law because they were the initial unjustified aggressors, and they started this. And they were committing the felonies against Ahmaud Arbery. They have to somehow justify their actions by claiming citizen's arrest. I'm going to remind you once again, evidence from the witness stand they never, ever said on February 23rd, 2020, that they were doing a citizen's arrest or trying to arrest him. It was all, we wanted to stop, we wanted to question him about what he was doing because he must have committed a crime that day and we were going to hold him so the police could go back and figure out what crime it was that he must have committed because he was running down the street. Citizen's arrest if the offense is committed in his presence or within his immediate knowledge. If the offense is a felony and the offender is escaping, a private person may arrest him. So what are they going to do? They're going to do this. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you this. A private person may not act on the unsupported statements of others alone for their probable cause. What does that mean? No gossip. No hearsay, nothing along those lines. In other words, my mom told me about this, where she has no personal knowledge of it, doesn't count. 
That's unsupported, unreliable statements of somebody else. You have to have more than stale information from an unreliable source. A private citizen's warrantless arrest must occur immediately after the per after the offense, or in the case of felonies, during the escape. If the observer fails to make the arrest immediately after the commission of the offense or during escape in the case, his power to do so is extinguished. Now, what does that really mean? A citizen's arrest is for emergency situations when the crime really happens right in front of you and you can take action right then and there to arrest somebody because you know about it. You've seen it. You're taking action right then and there. If it's a felony, you can run after the person and chase them down. That's all this means. So it's not a citizen's arrest. They never said it. None of the defendants saw Mr. Arbery commit any crime that day. They were detaining him for the police so that they could investigate and find the crime that he must have committed that day because what is he? He's running down the street. That's not the law, ladies and gentlemen. Not the law at all. Travis McMichael, remember all his assumptions? <clears throat> he got up here and I wrote them all down. He may have run by. Matt Albenzi may have seen him. He may have broken in. Maybe the owner's down there. He may have been caught. He may be trying to avoid the police. That's testimony from the witness stand. He didn't know anything. Absolutely nothing. So where are we going to end up? This is where we're going to end up. Travis McMichael had probable cause to believe that Ahmad stole the stuff off the English boat in 2019 because his mother gave him some gossip about stuff being stolen, and he was escaping. Use your common sense. How do you escape from a crime on an unknown date in 2019 on February 23rd, 2020? I'm sure they'll explain it to you. But use your common sense. And remember. What do you think? You think all this was completely made up for trial, especially given no one ever said it on February 23rd, 2020? Ladies and gentlemen, use your common sense. Put your critical thinking caps on. It's all the state can ask you to do. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the defense. <laughs>